the blue hymn book, He Leadeth Me. Of night, God leads his dear 
through great sorrow, but God gives a song in the night season and all the day long. Though sorrows befall us and Satan oppose, God leads his dear children along. Through grace we can Feed all our foes, God leads his dear children along. Some through the water, some through the flood, some through the fire, but all through the blood. Some through great sorrow, but God gives a song. Season and all the day long. Away from the mire and away from the clay, God leads his dear children along. Away up in glory, eternity's day, God leads his dear children. song in the night season and all the day long. One more before Brother John comes up, number 308. 308. Sing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day. Still praying as I'm onward bound. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's stable land, a higher plane than I have. Some may dwell where these abound. My prayer, my aim is higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's stable land. A higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. I want to live above the Satan's darts at me are hurled, for faith has caught the joyful sound, the song of saints on higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand, by faith on heaven's table land, a higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Scale the utmost high and catch a gleam of glory bright. But still I'll pray till heaven I found. Lord, lead me on to higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table land, a higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Okay, you can be seated. Good singing this afternoon. All right, good afternoon. I guess this thing's good to go. Sounds like it. <clears throat> 
still getting used to afternoon services and saying that. I want to come up here and say good evening, but uh, that wouldn't be appropriate. So, um, <clears throat> I don't know if it's. Uh, it seems like every time our pastor's gone, and obviously Abby being gone with him, uh, it seems like the services are a lot more somber. I don't know if it's just because he's gone or because of the guitar playing, because that kind of puts us in a mellow mood. We're all like uh, singing along. <laughs> We're like, Lord, lead me on to higher ground. You know, <laughs> we all sound depressed or something. <laughs> But everything's everything's still good. Lord, Lord's the same. Okay, <laughs> we're we're all good. <laughs> Where you guys heard I was preaching, you're like, ah, oh, great. <laughs> this guy, this guy's up. <laughs> well, um, I should have brought some jokes to cheer you up, but I don't, I'm not. Uh, you look up jokes, and I just think they're all cheesy. So, so I, I brought something more depressing. So, uh, <laughs> so this is a like I said last time. I always read some dumb article and just kind of make fun of it. So, here I am again. So uh, this is a. Uh, Saw this the other day. It was uh, the University of Pennsylvania nominates a trans swimmer, Leah Thomas. So L I A, spelled like that. Maybe it was a Liam and they removed the M. I'm not sure. But uh, for the 2022 NCAA Women of the Year Award. So this dude won, uh, won a title, national title earlier this year. And then they selected him to win the Women of the Year Award. Most of it's just, you know bunch of stupidity um, and it's it's one of those things I, I uh, my wife knew I was reading it she's not here she's over there in the nursery but she's like why do you read that that we all know everything's like that and you know there's no point in reading that well um, for one of the reasons I read it um, I like to make fun of it it's just my personality I like to pull out the the bad and try to I don't know it's just I'm maybe I'm a depressing personality <laughs> but uh, I always look at the negative of everything so so that's probably part of it also. But um, also, I, I think uh, we still have to be in a, a place where we can make fun of those things and where we can, and there still needs to be, we don't have a lot of kids here tonight, obviously they're over there, but I still think people need to be pointing out the ridiculousness of some, some dude claiming to be a woman and trying to enter women's sports because he was too pathetic to beat them in. <laughs> you know, Liam or Leah or whatever his name is, he wasn't winning, women, winning in the women, uh, men's sport, so he jumped over the women's and he can compete finally. Woman of the year, good job. <laughs> um, there's at least, you know, uh, someone said, stood up and said something against it. Of course, it's the guy who's always saying something against it. It's uh, Ron DeSantis, the Florida governor. He says, the NCAA is destroying opportunities for women, making a mockery of its championships, and perpetuating a fraud by allowing her to compete. He didn't even say her. They just kind of throw that in there. At least what I could find. I looked up. He didn't use her. He didn't use the right proper pronoun or whatever. But uh, there's at least some people. There's a couple people out there still willing to stand up, but I like to be one of those people to, to mock the, the ridiculousness of, of uh, the day and age which we're living in, but you got to be able to make fun of it and laugh at it a little bit, um, or you take yourself too seriously, you know. <laughs> so, uh, go ahead and turn to Numbers chapter 13. Numbers chapter 13. Uh, you got nothing um, deep, or I usually like to have some, some, a message with a lot of thrust or a big push. Um, this isn't one of those messages. So if that's what you're looking for today, um, we're just doing something real basic, a uh, study on Caleb. Uh, the son of Jephunneh, um, just kind of looking at his life and just to hopefully pull some, some, uh, some of the character traits and the way in which he lived and, and draw some things from it. Um, before we get into it, let's uh, say a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we, uh, we do thank you for um, God, just the God we are able to serve, and we thank you for the truth and a church to build a meet in, and God, that we can get around your word and God just uh, pull something from as we did this morning God from uh, the lives of different uh, people that uh, you had written about and try to learn something from it and try to apply it to our life the do's and the don'ts and um, pray that uh, just this study now would uh, serve that purpose God and pray that you just help your people and uh, we also pray for our pastor be with him as he's uh, will be preaching this evening uh, over at Open Door and just uh, bless the services over there as well we thank you and pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So, uh, so like I said, we're going to be looking at Caleb. Um, obviously, a very common character, at least preached about. For the same instance, we'll be looking at him. He's not, he's not mentioned a lot in the Bible. Um, you know, you only have a couple different times, and it's most of it's associated with this exact story um, in, in Numbers 13. And 
you know, there's a couple of reasons I like to do a character study. Um, obviously, you can draw some things from someone's life and, and kind of make maybe a character more relatable, maybe draw some things from that. Um, but also, you know, it's one of those things I like to do a character study myself, but it's to also encourage you guys to find someone in the Bible you like or find interesting and, and study about them. And a lot of times you'll find there's, little, there's things in the details um, more there than, than you would think just reading over it or just hearing about it on Sunday or just breezing through it in your daily reading. Kind of as uh, uh, Brother J.R. was talking this morning, kind of combing through those passages and trying to find some things. I really don't have anything um, revelatory today on Caleb, but still it's good to look through some things and maybe kind of somewhat read between the lines a little bit in his life. And so um, maybe just encourage you guys to do the same. Like I said, I'm, I'm, every time I feel like I do one of these, I study on a character, ends up being a man who's like a fighter or warrior. Maybe that's, just, that's probably just me. So if you're not into that and you're like, okay, another, another dude that's killing someone, that's great. You know, find something you like. You know, if you're a woman, find a woman that you find interesting or, and, and study it out and, and try to learn something and, and allow God to show you some, some things. And so, um, you know, it's just that the manhood part of it appeals to me personally. It's, it's one of those things. And, uh, you know, and I, and, Looking, you, look at, you have to look into the Bible to find a man anymore, what the, the world calls a man yeah. and the terminology. That, it, they don't exist. <laughs> there is no such thing as a man hardly in the world today. I mean, what they're saying is a man. And the same, yeah, same applies for a woman, what we just saw. Um, and so, you, you know, you have to come back to the Bible and find some manhood. And if you're, if you're a young man or you're uh, hoping to be one day, <laughs> um, and if you're a woman, you, fi- you look and find something from the Bible and see, draw from the character's there and see what it's like. Um, draw some, um, some good traits that you can apply to your life. You know, Caleb here in Numbers 13, for all practical purposes, uh, he's a nobody at this point. He's not even mentioned up till this point. And um, you probably wouldn't know who Caleb is if it weren't for this exact story and for him bringing a good report of the land. Uh, I doubt any one of you could name the other 10 spies. I'm not going to put you on the spot because probably don't. I probably couldn't before reading this passage, right? And before studying it out. But you have 10 other men outside of Joshua and Caleb, and no one knows who they are. They're just, and if Caleb would have been just in that number, you wouldn't care. No one would be named Caleb today. No one's named Eagle with an I. Okay. There's maybe some weirdos that name it after a bird. I don't know. <laughs> but there's some of the names here. You don't see kids mention that or called that. You hear Caleb still today. It's still You still hear about Joshua. Obviously very common. Um, and so, so you have Caleb here. Uh, we'll start in verse 1, and we're going to read uh, most of this passage, and then we're going to read another passage. So bear with me as we read a little bit here. It says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, uh, verse 1, obviously, Send thou men, that they may search the land of Canaan, which I give unto the children of Israel, of every tribe of their fathers, shall ye send a man, and every ruler among them. And Moses, by commandment of the Lord, sent from them the wilderness of Paran, all those uh, men were heads of the children of Israel. And then list the names. I'm not going to read through them for sake of time. Skip down to verse 17. And Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan and said unto them, Get you up this way southward and go up in, into the mountain and see the land, what it is, and the people that dwelleth therein, whether they be strong or weak, few or many, and what the land is that they dwell in, whether it be good or bad, and what the cities they be that they dwell in, whether, the t- uh, whether in tents or in strongholds. And what the land is, whether it be fat or lean, or whether there be wood therein or not, and be of good courage, and bring of the fruit of the land. Now the time, uh, or now the time, was the time of the first ripe grapes. So they went up and searched the land from the wilderness of Zin unto Rehob, as men uh, come to Hamath. Now skip down with me actually to verse uh, 27. They're all coming back and going to present it before Moses. Um, and it says, uh, and they came... And they told him and said, We came unto the land whither thou sentest us, and surely it floweth with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there, and the Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. The, but the men that went up with him said, We be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land which they searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land though which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof, and all the men 
that we saw in it are men of great stature. So hold your place here. So you're kind of seeing, and now we're skipping ahead uh, to Joshua. <clears throat> we'll flip right back here. Uh, go to Joshua chapter... Uh, oh, I'm in the wrong spot. <clears throat> Joshua chapter 14. So in the first few verses of Joshua 14, obviously, like I said, we're skipping ahead 40 years, actually 45 years to be exact. And uh, obviously they've been in the wilderness and everything that's taken place at that time. In verse 6, uh, he's, or the first few verses, he's dividing up the land and then starting verse 6. says, Then the children of Judah came unto Joshua in Gilgal, and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, said unto him, Thou knowest the thing that the Lord said unto Moses, the man of God, concerning me and thee in Kadesh Barnea. Forty years old was I when I... Uh, I, when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to espy out the land, and I brought him word again as it was in mine heart. Nevertheless, my brethren that went up with me made the heart of the people melt, but I wholly followed the Lord my God. And Moses swore on that day, saying, Surely the land wherein thy feet have trodden shall be thine inheritance, and thy children's forever, because thou hast wholly followed the Lord my God. And now, behold, the Lord hath kept me alive, as he has said, these forty and five years. Even since the Lord spake this word unto Moses... While the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness, and now, lo, I am this day fourscore and five years old, and as I am yet this day, as strong this day as I was in the day that Moses sent me, as my strength was then, even so is my strength now, for war both to go out and to come in. Now therefore give me this mountain, whereof the Lord has spake in that day, for thou heardest in that day how the Anakims were there, and that the cities were great and fenced, and if so be, the Lord will be with me, then I shall be able to drive them out. And then Joshua blesses Caleb there. All right, now flip back to Numbers 13. Just trying to make sure you kind of have uh, the background of what's taking place here. And the first thing I want to look at in Numbers 13, uh, and the first point or attribute of Caleb is that he's a leader already. So you see, um, look in verse 2 of chapter 13, "...send thou men that they may search the land of Canaan, which I give unto the children of Israel, and of every tribe of their fathers." Ye shall send a man, every one, a ruler among them. So Caleb is already a, a ruler of the people of Judah. One of the rulers, I don't know if he would be the ruler, but definitely one of the rulers uh, among them, as it says there in the verse. And all of these men that are mentioned, obviously, that go in, all of the 12, uh, the, the rulers of each tribe. And so he's a leader, and you see that even more so. Um, or you want to take note, obviously, these weren't just a bunch of nobodies. Uh, all of these men, now we wouldn't know most of their names today, but at that time in Israel's history, they were powerful men and, and rulers of their different tribes. And they, weren't, they didn't just pick a bunch of, you know, guys that, that weren't interested in fighting, that were a bunch of scaredy cats that had never been in the battle. No, they're picking the rulers and saying, and back then, you, in order to be a ruler, you had to fight. <laughs> you weren't just thrust in that position as, you know, a 16-year-old boy. So you have to take the consideration. These are all a bunch of men, warriors, and they're all going in. And so they had, Caleb has a good start. He's a ruler, like I said. He's of the tribe of Judah. You see that in verse 6. Obviously, uh, I would say the best tribe uh, of the children of Israel. And, um, you know, as you see here, um, now this is kind of a side note, but you see note Moses here in verse, uh, verse 18. He tells the people to go. He says, and see the land, what it is, and the people that dwell therein. Now, they were, the Lord sent them to, to see the land and to check it out. He said, search out the land. That was in verses 1 and 2 and 3 there. And he says, see the land, uh, what it is that the people dwell in, whether they be strong or weak, few or many. Nothing wrong with that. And what, and what the land is that they dwell in, whether it be good or bad. And what the cities they be that, they dwell, that dwell in, whether in tents or in strongholds. And what the land is, whether it be fat or lean. So two things he asks that to me jump out. He says, whether the land be good or bad and whether the land be fat or lean. Now, if you know the promise of the promised land <laughs> and the story of it, it, it was not given that it was going to be a bad land. Um, look with me. Hold your place here. Go to Exodus. Exodus chapter, uh, <clears throat> Exodus chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3, and look at verse 8. Of course, this is the Lord talking to Moses um, out of the burning bush. <clears throat> and it says, And I am come down 
to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, to bring them up out of the land unto a good land, and a large, unto a land flowing with milk and honey. And then it's so on and so forth. Now look at verse 17, same chapter. It says again, I've said I will bring you up out of the, uh, out of the affliction of Egypt unto the land of the Canaanites, Hittites, and the Amorites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, unto a land flowing with milk and honey. And uh, you see it again, we won't turn there, but Exodus 13, 5, same thing, a land that's flowing with milk and honey. And it was a good land. That was a promise. The Lord had given that as a promise. It's a good land. It's a large land. It's flowing with milk and honey. And then Moses, I don't know if he was having some doubt at this time, but he says, go see if it's a good land or if it's bad. Go see if, uh, you know, if it's lean or fat, uh, what, what's going on there. And I you know, that's kind of a study for a different time, but it's kind of interesting that that takes place. And then you go on in Numbers 13, um, and you read here in verse, uh, go verse 26, or 27, I should say. And the people, it says, they, it says and they told him. So it looks like uh, of the 12 tribes, most of them got together. It says they. So they're kind of speaking as a group, right? One person's most likely doing the speaking, but they've all kind of, convened and, and are on the same page about this, except for a couple of them. And it says, And they said, We came unto the land whither thou sentest us, and surely it floweth with milk and honey. So even you have to take into consideration, even the ten here knew that it was called a land flowing with milk and honey. They're kind of like, you know, the Lord didn't really undersell it. I would describe it as a land flowing with milk and honey. <laughs> that was his words, and this is exactly what we saw. Look at the fruit of the land. And, you know, you, you ha so they're all coming in. They're speaking to Moses, and they're talking of the glory of the land. They're like, it's a beautiful land. It's, it's magnificent. Never seen anything like it. And then they start uh, showing off the fruit. It says, and they showed the fruit of it. And you, have, you know that in verse 24, the cluster of the grapes, they cut down where two men, or verse 23, I should say, two men upon a staff are carrying one cluster of grapes. Huge bundles of grapes. They're getting pomegranates. I imagine the pomegranate's the size of a basketball. You know, you're, you're, that's just because I like basketball. But, <laughs> but just proportionally, I mean, there, everything's, you know, a fig is probably much bigger than a softball you're, if you're taken comparatively to the uh, cluster of grapes. And so everything's huge. They're showing off all this fruit. It looks great. I'm sure it's the best tasting fruit they've ever had. And everything's going great. And you, you know Caleb and Joshua are there, and they're like, yep, this is, they're just nodding along. This is right. This is what we saw. And all of a sudden... It says, nevertheless, in verse 28, the people be strong that dwell in the land. And the cities are walled and very great, and moreover we saw the children of Anak there. And the Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. At this point, Caleb's had enough. <laughs> he's, he's, it was green, and then it just turns, and he's like, what? You know, what's, what's going on? This is not what I saw. I saw, yeah, there, was, there were large people there, but the Lord already promised us this land. And, and Caleb stilled the people. That's like silenced people. In modern day vernacular, he said, shut up. <laughs> That's enough. <laughs> I, I've heard enough. That's not the land that the Lord gave to us. And, and, and starts to speak up. And C Caleb's one of these characters that's very brash. You can tell by the little bit that he's in there. He's telling all the other rulers, no, uh, that's enough. And, and even you have Moses here knows the same thing. And he's not speaking up. He's allowing him to talk. And see, and I almost think the Lord used Caleb to maybe even be a burr in the side of Moses, for he was asked, is it good, is it bad, you know, and, and Caleb's like, no, this is the land that the Lord promised us, and, and he goes on, um, he says, let us go up at once, and that just shows his extremist personality, he's saying, let's go right now, <laughs> I'm ready to go to battle, I'm ready to fight these guys, uh, let us go up at once, and, and, and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it, and he, of course, has a lot of confidence in what the Lord said, it's not necessarily just confidence in his own strength, and his own might, because comparatively, he wouldn't have been as strong as the giants that he saw there. And so um, you can just see that uh, Caleb's a leader. He speaks up when no one else, everyone's kind of let. You don't have Joshua even speaking up. And Joshua's, throughout the entirety of the Bible, Joshua's a much bigger character than Caleb and a much more powerful man throughout his life and did a lot more. But here in this, this instance, Caleb's the only one speaking up as the voice of reason. What are we talking about here? We're talking about the land that the Lord promised us. You have to, you have to think that Caleb grew up in captivity in the, in, in, in the land of Egypt. He spent his first 40 years in captivity. They finally get out of that. They're going into the land. The Lord, the promise, they've already seen some miracles. They've seen some great things. They go and check the land out, and it's the best land they've ever seen. 
The Lord's literally, His promises are just being fulfilled as they're coming up. And, and He's ready to go to war, and the people are, nope, we're not, we can't do it. We're not able to overcome it. And so you can understand being a, a, a leader as He is, He's frustrated. And um, always being a, being a leader, being a natural leader as, as Caleb is, doesn't always, they, they lead when no one else is following still. They, they don't just lead when they have a big bandwagon <laughs> to follow with them. And, you know, he speaks up, doesn't go as well as he would like. You see in verse 31, but the men that went up with him said, we are not able to go up against these people for they are stronger than we. And we kind of already read this. They start just saying ridiculous things here. You read in the, the end of verse 32, that the land eateth up the inhabitants thereof. What does that even mean? <laughs> the land's eating the inhabitants? You just told us how big the giants were, and now the land's eating them. And you were just telling us how great the land was, but now it's eating up the inhabitants. It's a bad land. <laughs> it's no good. And so you see um, everything that's taking place here. They're just, they don't want to go at all. And Caleb's the only one that's speaking up. So, of course, you know Joshua is also on Caleb's side. Look down at verse 6 of chapter 14. And Joshua the son of Nun, and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, which were of them that searched the land, rent their clothes. They're both distraught at what's taking place. And they spake unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through to search it is an exceeding good land. If the Lord delight in us, then we'll bring us into this land and give it to us, a land which floweth with milk and honey. He's reminding them of their own words. Look, we need to go take this land. Verse 9, Only rebel ye not against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bred for us. Their defense is departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Fear them not. He's rebuking them. <laughs> He says, uh, only rebel ye not against the Lord. He talks about how good. He says, you're rebelling against the Lord. Why, why would you do that? And um, goes on, neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bred for us. <laughs> the way Caleb is, he's, they're bred for us. They're nothing. <laughs> We're going to eat them up. They're, they're the, it's not going to be the land eating anyone, or they're going to be whipping us. They're, they're bred for us, <laughs> is the way he words it. He says, their defense is departed from them. Um, you know, maybe... Maybe even Caleb, because the Lord knew Caleb's stance, maybe he saw something that the rest of them didn't see. I'm just putting out there where Joshua did, because they says their defense has departed from them. Um, maybe he saw they weren't prepared to go to battle. And, and the Lord showed him that because he knew he was wanting to go no matter what. <laughs> um, and so you just you take all of this into consideration. He's, he's leading, though, no matter what. And you know, it, he's not really loved for it. Look at verse 10. But all the congregation bade stone them with stones. And so the, the people are all, get rid of these guys. They're just going to cause us to get killed, so let's just kill them first. And you see that uh, he's a leader. When no one else is following, he's going to lead. And, of course, with time, you see that uh, continues. Um, look at, um, <clears throat> go to Judges chapter 3. Hold your place here. Judges chapter 3, and you look that he must have been a leader because he was an example to a younger brother of his. You see this is later on. This is really after uh, Caleb's out of the picture. And look at verse 8. It says, Therefore the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he sold them into the hand of Chushan Rishatham, king of Mesopotamia. And the children of Israel served Chushan Rishatham eight years and when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer to the children of Israel, who delivered them, even Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother. And the Spirit of the Lord was came upon him, and he judged Israel, and went out to war. And the Lord delivered uh, Chushan Rishathaim, uh, king of Mesopotamia, into the hand, and his hand prevailed against Chushan Rishathaim. We're still saying that. No. And the land had rest forty years, and Othniel, the son of Kenaz, died. And so um, his younger brother here, Othniel, um, is a warrior as well and ends up being a deliverer for Israel. And I think he had to get some of that fight in him from his older brother. Now, especially if you, I grew up with a bunch of brothers, you usually look up to the older brother, at least for a while, until they do something really stupid and then you've been questioning your life goal. <laughs> but, um, but you usually look up to an older brother and if you take um, the thought that they were in the, the wilderness for 40 years and everyone 20 years old and upward had died, uh, his younger brother had to be less than 20 years younger than him. So he was quite a bit younger. It wasn't just like he was the year younger and they fought all the time growing up. He's, he's looked up, I mean, he's old enough to be his father, you know, and so looked up to him and he was a warrior. And, of course, he was, I mean, even you take that 
when they're going into the land of Canaan and fighting all these guys after 40 years of being in the wilderness, Caleb and Joshua are two of the only people that had saw battle prior to this. And so they're, of course, leading the charge and, and leading into battle. Um, you know, the rest of them are, I don't know about you, but I, I would be ready to follow someone uh, that an older man that was said he's as strong as he's ever been. He's the only one that's been in, one of the few people that's ever been in battle. And he's ready to charge up into a mountain full of giants and, <laughs> and, and fight. And so, um, and you see his, his attitude as we read earlier in Joshua 13. And that's the next thing that makes him a leader. He's a leader that's willing to fight. And he's willing to go and put his own life at stake and fight and lead in the cause. And if you take throughout history any of the greatest generals that men looked up to, they were, they were leading the charge. Um, I'm, I'm Scottish, so I like uh, Scottish historical figures like Robert the Bruce. And you read about him, and he charged front head into the battle. He was one of the first people attacking the enemy every time, and the, and the leader. And how are you not going to follow the man that's, let's go, and he's leading everything. He has the most to lose, and he's, he's putting it all on the line and, and not you know, sitting back and sending you in. And, and so um, he's ready to, just to go into battle and ready to fight. And... You know, no one, I, as far as I can tell, actually go back to Joshua 14, or yeah, go to Joshua 14, verse 9. But as far as I can tell, uh, in the promises that Caleb and Joshua would, would be spared and they wouldn't die in the wilderness and they'd be given the land, as it talks about, uh, it never, is what I can see, it never says that uh, Caleb would have to fight for that land. It says he would go into the land and it would be, it would be given to him for possession for his children from that generation forward. And so every time he saved Caleb the son of Jew, and it would be given him. And it never says that he had to actually go into battle. And honestly, I don't think that anyone would have judged Caleb as an 85-year-old man not wanting to go into battle. <laughs> Say, this is the land the Lord promised me. You guys go in. <laughs> and no one would have thought anything of it. And no one would have, no one would have questioned it. Um, and, but not, not Caleb. He, he's ready to fight no matter what. And... I saw, growing up in Bible Baptist, growing up under Dr. Rutman, all through his ministry that I got to see was a blessing. But it was really a blessing to see him at the end when he was 93 years old and he was still going out on the street and preaching, lifting up a Bible. Amen. He's sitting there in a three-piece suit. <laughs> it's above 90 degrees, hot as can be. And these 20-year-olds are like, oh, it's too hot today. I can't go out there and preach. And he's just out there holding his Bible. You could hardly hear him because he had no voice left, but he's preaching and doing what he can. And... And no one, would have, no one would have judged him if he stayed back and sent everyone forward. But he still wanted to fight. And I'll just say this. It seems to be a theme lately that we're preaching at the older men. It seems like that's been happening lately. And the older men and women. But no one's going to judge you if you don't do what some of the younger people are doing and keeping up with the same schedule. <laughs> no one is. Um, but I think that you guys are more of an inspiration than you know. But just being faithful and keep fighting. And, and whatever you have left, whatever that looks like, uh, for each and every one of you, but being willing to fight and, and being willing to faithfully go to church and all those things. That encourages us more than you know, more than a, a young kid coming to church, which I enjoy that too, and it's great to see, and that's an encouragement. But seeing someone faithful up in years, and you know that Caleb had an effect when he's, he's ready to go into battle, and no one's even close to hardly his age except Joshua, and he's ready to charge in. Um, <clears throat> You read here, um, we'll read the verses again. We already kind of read them in verse 9 of Ch uh, Joshua 14. And Moses swear on that day, saying, Surely the land whereon thy feet have trodden shall be thine inheritance and thy children's forever, because thou hast wholly followed the Lord my God. And uh, skip down to verse 11. We read this earlier, but he says, And as I am yet strong this day as I was in the day that Moses sent me, as my strength was then, even so is my strength now. For war both to go out and to come in. Now therefore give me this mountain whereof the Lord spake in that day. For thou heardest in that day how the Anakims were there and that the cities were great and fenced. If so be that the Lord will be with me, then I shall be able to drive them out as the Lord said. And so he's, he's ready to go into war. He says, my strength is today as it was back then. And that's obviously a, a remarkable thing and a miracle. I don't see any 85-year-old guys that are as strong as they were when they're 40. Maybe if they start juicing when they're 70, but, but I don't think that's, that's the case typically. And so it's obviously the Lord sustaining him, um, but he's still giving that strength and not saying, yeah, I feel good, but I don't have to go into battle. No, he's going to use it. Lord, sustain me for a reason, and he's got me here for this very reason. And he says, give me this mountain. And 
And if you're here today, the Lord's given you still something to do, whether that looks like, um, whatever that might be, but to keep fighting. Um, <clears throat> you have to, uh, let's see here. All right, continuing, moving on. The next thing I want to look at is um, Caleb, another point or a trait of Caleb is he's different. He's not like everyone else. And you say, what makes Caleb different? Well, let's look at uh, verse 7. It says, uh, sorry, I'm not in, not in Joshua. Numbers 13, 7. I'll give you a second to turn there. Numbers chapter 13. Oh, maybe I was in the right spot and I looked at it wrong. My bad. Go back to Joshua. I'm just, I'm just seeing your Bible sword drills. Who's, who's got it? No. <laughs> All right, Joshua 14. Yeah, I just missed it. Joshua 14, verse 7. It says, Forty years old was I when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me out from Kadesh Barnea to espy out the land. And I brought him word again as it was in mine heart. And so I want to point out what makes him different is that some things that were in his heart. He had the right things in his heart. Now, we have a very good verse in the Bible, and it's a great verse, really, that points out the wickedness of our heart, and it's used all the time. Jeremiah 17, 9, you know, um, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And that's very true. Our heart's extremely wicked and, and deceitful. Uh, but I think sometimes that becomes almost an excuse. Like, yep, my heart's wicked. I just always love the wrong things. And, 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 and there's no effort to change that. And really, if you look at the Bible, your heart doesn't have to be deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. That is the natural man. And that's, that's the world. And that your heart can get there very easily, and it is there without some, um, some work. But you look into the Bible, you look at, uh, we won't turn there, but Second Chronicles 15, 15, uh, says, I sought them with my whole heart and sought them with their whole desire. In the Psalms, David mentions it a couple times. I will praise the Lord with my whole heart. Every bit of his heart praising the Lord. Does that sound like a wicked, deceitful heart? No, he's praising the Lord with his entire heart and his whole being. Love the Lord thy God with thy whole heart, soul, and mind. And, and so he also says, Create in me a clean heart, O God. He's not asking God to do something that is not there or impossible. Um, you know, the Bible also says, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. And so that's what has to take place. You have to keep your heart with all diligence. didn't say it was easy. Uh, diligently protecting your heart, keeping it loving and desiring the right things. Uh, if you le leave it to itself, it's deceitful above all things. And the deceitfulness sometimes is, like I said, becomes Christians excusing it like, yep, my heart's wicked. Well, that could be your heart deceiving you into just justifying sin or justifying uh, the things you desire. And so you have to fill it with the right things. And the, the Bible points it out, um, what was in uh, Caleb's heart, because he had the right things and he desired the right things. <clears throat> and you know what else is different about Caleb here? Look at Numbers 14, verse 24. Not 14. Yeah, Numbers. Go back to Numbers. <clears throat> numbers chapter 14, verse 24. It says, But my servant Caleb. And, and so you have, uh, he's called a servant here. He says, Because he had another spirit with him, and hath fought. Uh, hath fought followed me fully, him will I bring into the land, where and he went, and his seed shall possess it. And so he's a ruler, as we talked about, but the Lord calls him a servant. And he's willing to put himself low. He's willing to be the Lord's servant. And, you know, I, I kind of mentioned it kind of earlier, but you, even you do any reading on history um, and wars and different things, and I, I find that interesting and do some of that reading, and you see generals that really had an effect on men were willing to put themselves low were willing to put themselves with the men and not always just be above the men. Now, they didn't do that every day or they wouldn't have any respect of the men, right? I'm not saying they only served and, and um, their men, but the same thing goes for a pastor. He's called a minister to minister, right? He's above everyone to a certain extent, but also he ministers. And, and you take, um, just to name a few generals that, you know, their stories connect with him. If you know uh, Hannibal of Carthage, led the Carthage people, um, 
he's known for sleeping on the ground with his men at times and just not putting himself separated from the men, sleeping amongst them, being one of them and not always being above them. And then you had uh, Alexander the Great. I say he's not great, but in history he supposedly was. Um, and he's in the desert, though, and he re- all of the men are in the desert. They're dying of thirst, super thirsty, and someone brings him a helmet full of water, and he refuses it in front of the men because all his men are thirsty. How am I going to drink this water in front of them and be quenched? A- and showing that I'm, not, I'm with you guys on this, <laughs> and, and I, I can be low as well. And then uh, also one more, you have Julius Caesar. He slept on the porch of an old house while one of his, his men was kind of sick and frail, and he let him sleep inside. I mean, you're talking about Julius Caesar. He was a pretty arrogant guy, but, but he still, at times, was able to show himself humble and show himself a little lower just to help someone. And now these guys were wicked men, but they still had, they had a way of leading men, and they had a way of showing themselves a leader. And you can't knock at least that. There's, that's why I read about some of those things, because you can pull some, some attributes from them. And obviously lost men, but you, you have, of course, Caleb here in the same way. Um, he's not willing, not above being a servant. And I don't care what position or title any Christian gets, they should always be willing to be the Lord's servant. You know, Paul repeatedly calls himself the servant of the Lord. And, and so um, it's something that set Caleb apart and made him different. Um, no one else in that passage is called the servant of the Lord, except you could say maybe Moses was mentioned there. Um, another thing... Uh, we won't really cover it, but uh, I'll just mention in passing. It says he had another spirit, and he wasn't, and that's in verse 24 as well as we just read. And he wasn't just going along with the man's spirit and the way men think and thinking like these guys are stronger than us, they're more powerful than us, logically thinking this is not a good battle <laughs> to go into. And no, he had another spirit, and I believe that was the Holy Spirit. You know, David says, put a right spirit within me, and he's referring to the Holy Spirit. And it's a small s, the same here, another spirit. I think that's the Lord's spirit. He wasn't just man's spirit, not just like the rest of them. And then moving on, what's another mark um, that you see? Uh, the last one we'll kind of cover is he clung to God's words and the promises that were given him. Flip back one more time with me to Joshua 14. <clears throat> Joshua 14. And look at verse 6. Then the children of Judah came unto Joshua and Gilgal. And Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenazite, said unto him, Thou knowest the thing that the Lord said unto Moses, the man of God, concerning me and thee in Kadesh Barnea. He's reminding Joshua of the words that the Lord spoke, uh, or Moses spoke from the Lord. Look at verse 10. And now, behold, the Lord hath kept me alive as he said these forty and five years. Even since the Lord spake this word unto Moses, while the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness, and now, lo, I am this day fourscore and five years old. Again, he says, as he said. And um, you also have in the other passage, we won't turn there. He says, if the Lord will be with me. And, and then in uh, verse, <clears throat> verse 8, no, not verse 8. Mm. I don't know where that is, but actually it says uh, also... Uh, yeah, it's in Numbers 14.8. If the Lord delight in us. And so every time he's fully dependent upon the Lord and he's reminding Joshua of the Lord's promises and he's bringing up, this is what the Lord said. This, he had to cling to those promises and he remembered what Moses said. Uh, Forty years, 40 and five years. Um, Forty years, he was, like I said, he was in captivity. Forty years in the wilderness. And then five years after they get into the land, they're, they're wiping out. Uh, some enemies, but they hadn't got to there. And he says, I think it's time to go claim what the Lord promised me. <laughs> it's time to go claim that mountain that the Lord said that was mine. And so at 85, he goes in there and goes after what the Lord had said and promised him. And he hadn't lost hope. And it's a, it's a great thing. And really the only thing we have to cling to is the words of God. And we've got much better promises than a piece of land in Canaan. I don't care how beautiful it was. <laughs> we, got a, we got real estate in heaven and, and it's far better in the land of Canaan. And we got many, many more promises and, and a sure word of prophecy, as the Bible says, to cling to. And much more than just the words that Mo- he overheard Moses say that were from the Lord. Now, it was a powerful thing. And I'm not downplaying, but what we have is so much more. And, and so much more to cling to. And you notice what else he cling to. He cling to the Lord. It says in uh, Deuteronomy 136, you won't have to turn there, it says he wholly followed the Lord. Wholly, completely. And 
You know that phrase is only mentioned five times in the scripture about a person wholly fallen the Lord? Guess who it's in reference to every time? Caleb. <laughs> he wholly followed the Lord. And you know, uh, Josh was in that context with him one of those times. But every time that phrase is mentioned, it's in connection with Caleb. And so it shows he, he was of another spirit. <laughs> and he's completely and wholly followed the Lord and, and made it his effort to follow him. Even when not just into battle, when it was exciting, but being patient in the wilderness. You know how hard it must have been after you're this close to getting to the promised land and you knew you were supposed to go into the promised land. The Lord promised it and everyone else says, no. And then you've got to go into the wilderness for 40 years and be patient and wait on God. And, he, and guess what he did? He wholly followed the Lord. And he, he, st he stuck to it. And, you know, there was a lot of other believers there, you could say, or Israelites that followed the Lord probably a little bit. Followed them to a certain way. They had followed them all the way through the time of, of captivity, through the, the Red Sea. They'd seen some great things. And so they had followed them some, but they didn't wholly follow the Lord. They didn't completely give everything to the Lord. And, and so that's something notable about him. And really, you know, we don't need any more half hearted Christians. They are everywhere. <laughs> and not just, I mean, in Bible, even churches too. Just, not, just kind of follow them a little bit, follow them when it's convenient, follow them to church maybe. Maybe not. Um, but no effort to sell out to the Lord. And, and we need some more zeal. Like Caleb, he's holy fallen the Lord. That was his goal. That was his life. And you see how the Lord blessed him for it. He has strength at 85, and he's one of the few that's still around. Um, that, that's not a, not a light thing. And um, just kind of wrapping it up, um, you know, hopefully you can pull some things from Caleb here. Uh, there's definitely some traits that, like I say, I would say are admirable in him just being a man that's willing to fight. And that's, that's, I would say, a big problem today is, and this goes in a carnal sense too, I mean, people talk like they want to fight, no one wants to fight anymore. That's <laughs> even, even uh, you know, confrontation with people, people have big mouths and then they don't really want to fight. <laughs> that's hoping you get scared off and then, <laughs> and, and back down. And, and that goes so much more in the Christian life where there's a lot of people talking with a lot of bravado and, yeah, you know, serve the Lord to the battle and all this stuff and then, there, there's no effort put into that. And there's no, nothing that's backing that up. And so, if nothing else, uh, you can take a man like Caleb and read that, I mean, no matter what age he was at, he was ready to fight, and ready to fight for the Lord. And also be patient when you need to be patient. And sit back and follow the Lord every step of the way. And, you know, sometimes, you know, people say, if you fight, you're making enemies. Well, they're already your enemies. You have to understand that. Uh, the people that you're not fighting, that you're trying to get along with, they're already your enemies. Um, you just make it known, more legible. We are, I'm against you. And that's what it's for. And that's, what, that's why people won't street preach. That's why people won't pass out tracts because that's fighting the spirit of this age. And that's fighting the things that are going on. It, it's doing those things to, to stand out, being willing to. And Caleb was willing to stand up to all the other people of Israel. Um, we ought to be willing to stand up for the Lord. And so we'll just, we'll close in a word of prayer and wrap this thing up. Dear Lord, we uh, thank you. For just, uh, God, some examples in your scripture. Uh, thank you for Caleb and uh, something we can look to as a man that followed you and was ready to fight, ready to go to battle and of a different spirit and different heart. And just pray that uh, you'd help us to apply these things uh, to our life this week. And uh, we thank you for all you do. And, God, we pray that you'd help all of us in our faithfulness to you. We love you and pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you are dismissed.